The uh, title kind of gives it away. We're talking about handling of external clinical information in small primary care practices. So we're going to focus on that area and define our terms a bit more. But a little bit about the big wave. A lot of people have talked about the tsunami of information that's overwhelming uh, all clinicians at this point, both electronic, paper, and all sorts of forms. So this is just kind of a nice reminder of what small practices are having to deal with in terms of this onslaught of information. So it's not just me that thinks that, though. Um, I was really struck, in fact, one of the inspirations for this work was the paper by John uh, Beasley et al., including several human factors people in the maps of Wisconsin, that, that termed this information chaos. And in the Beasley paper, they talk about five different types of information hazards, if you will, that affect primary care. And these include just too much information, missing or incomplete information, fragmentation and siloing that we all know about, uh, conflicting information, and information that's just plain wrong. And in the paper, they say that these can lead to not only cognitive overload of conditions, but also a loss of situational awareness. And because a lot of my perspective comes from reading about human factors and working with Dr. Punk at Oregon State, situational awareness really struck me. So that theme will come up a couple times today. So that was the inspiration. Uh, as part of the dissertation, though, there was a lit review. And that lit review included 89 papers that broke out basically into three categories. Uh, the first category was on work practices. What are people doing in small practices? Not just to handle lab results, although that was the vast majority of the papers, but also referral reports, discharge summaries, admission notifications, anything that I'm lumping into the category external clinical information. But as I say, most of these work practice papers focused on laboratory uh, tests or, or radiology tests. Information hazards, there was a laundry list of information hazards. Basically, again, information could be missing when it was needed, diagnosis or follow-up could be absent, handling steps were poorly documented. In fact, several of these studies looked at how well handling steps were logged in, initials placed on pieces of paper, sign-offs done in electronic health records, and the documentation was very poor. Now, whether that means the practices were also poor is a subject of discussion. And then finally, tracking of requests is largely an ad hoc care. And then finally, the interventions. What has been proposed to solve this? Well, as you'd expect, health information technology has been the leading one, and, and the vast majority of papers were on electronic health records for managing these types of information. Again, mainly test results. And they pointed out that hybrid systems, systems that included both paper elements as well as electronic health records, performed less well than either a fully paper or a fully electronic system. This idea of having different workflows for different media seemed to, there seems to be evidence that that makes things worse. So that's the literature. In formulating a uh, research question, I wanted to look at the socio-technical system. So not just the workflow, you know, not just what they do, but why they do it and how they interact with each other to do those things. So as you can see the research question, what socio-technical factors shape how small primary care practices handle external clinical information. And we'll define those terms a little bit more in a moment. And I divided that up into three specific aims. The first is simply to describe not only the work, but the context in which that work takes place. Second, to compare the factors that shape those work practices. And third, to try to identify implications for designers, not just designers of information technology, but designers of process and process improvement. So what can we learn from these practices? So some definitions very quickly. I already defined external clinical information. Keep in mind that I'm including not just test results coming in from outside laboratories, but also referral reports, discharge summaries, anything that's patient-specific, clinical, and comes from an outside source. So that's the input side of our system diagram here. On the right-hand side, we have primary care. And there are many definitions of what primary care is, but I had to define that for the purposes of the study. And I chose Barbara Starfield's definition with basically four pillars of primary care. Now again, this is subject to discussion as to what the best definition might be. But it allowed me to say, what do I think primary care is? First contact, longitudinal, comprehensive, and coordinated. So that really shaped how I define my terms. And then in the center, we have the processes themselves. Input, output, process. A socio-technical system that actually transforms information into 
if not knowledge, into clinical action. And then finally, down below, we have the impact of the external environment on those processes. So again, those of you who know general systems theory, this is a very simplified version of a systems diagram. But that is the conceptual model that really guided this work. My focus, of course, was in the middle here and also the external constraints. So how did we uh, decide to do it? Well, the, we broke the three aims down into individual stages of, of the study. The first part of the study was uh, a field study of four small primary care practices here in Oregon. Each one was analyzed independently to try to understand the work, the context, and the constraints that shaped that work. So four independent analyses. And two, compare them using the output of the first analysis to do an apples-to-apples -apples comparison of the four clinics and to try to infer what does this mean on a broader scale. And then finally, the implications were designed. Um, this study was approved by uh, OHSU's IRB in June. Sampling. Once again, I fall back on those definitions we talked about. First, delivery of primary care. What does that mean? So I looked at family practices, internal medicine specialists that told me that they focused on delivering primary care. So that was largely self-reported. Uh, independent and autonomous. Autonomy is kind of an interesting idea in small practices. Independent is fairly standard definition. They're not owned by a hospital, a health system, or a new practice. It's, a, uh, if you will, a mom and pop physician practice or a small partnership clinic. So independent. Autonomous is a little trickier because what does that actually mean? An autonomous clinic makes their own decisions. They choose their own electronic health record. They hire. They fire. They decide what uh, scope their medical assistants will be allowed to do in their practice. That's what I meant by autonomy, because my goal was to find out why they do things. And in a clinic that was forced to do things a certain way, including using somebody's, somebody else's electronic health record, I felt that would limit the data that I uh, uh, collected. Uh, practice size between 1 and 10, small practices, uh, receive information from multiple external sources, separated geographically. Uh, we know that uh, healthcare is delivered in pockets or regions or medical neighborhoods. <coughs> so a medical neighborhood uh, might share certain resources, a laboratory, an industry center, a hospital. So I tried to identify sites that were distant enough that they didn't have overlapping spheres of healthcare resources. A little difficult to do, and it's not a scientific process, but I think by looking at the map and spreading them out, I, I, I accomplished that. Finally, I wanted to look at some sites with and some sites without an electronic health record. I was unable to recruit a site that did not have an electronic health record. I, I could not recruit them. Out. So I looked at two. Neither of them uh, agreed to participate in the study. Now, that is a limitation of the study, and I'll address that uh, as we get towards the end. So I found four sites, enrolled them, and did a study. The data collection was done using typical traditional qualitative uh, research methods, including semi-structured interviews uh, with a written interview guide that included written probes. Um, we also did a lot of free-form interviewing, but the bulk of the data collection was through structured instruments. Observation forms were predefined to sort of guide my focus as I did field observation. Uh, and that became very important, given all the things to look at and all the bright, shiny objects I wanted to explore. So having an observation form turned out to be uh, really critical. Um, again, in typical qualitative research, I kept uh, fairly detailed notes and jottings, little notes that I would write as I walked through the clinics, maps, diagrams, sketches, and reflective notes. And reflections were important because as a lab technologist by training, I tend to gravitate towards labs and understand this. So one of my biases is to either want to hear more about lab results or go the other direction and not focus enough on them because I feel I need to know more about other types of information. So the reflective notes did help uh, figure out kind of where I was focusing during the day. Documents and artifacts were important, cheat sheets, notes, uh, little routing forms that they would paper clip to a chart, anything like that. Photographs. Um, I was very selective about photographs. I made sure I had uh, permission that there was no PHI in, in the frame of the photo. You'll see a number of those photos today. But I didn't do a lot of those, but they were very helpful when I was doing the analysis as a reminder. For example, um, I had uh, misnoted that a printer had two trays, one for lab, one for other stuff, when in fact it was two separate printers. And the photograph helped remind me of that. 
So pilot testing was done here at OHSU through three mock interviews uh, with several people who they know, a day of observation at one of OHSU's clinics, and one of the sites had the same EHR that OHSU used. So that turned out to be very useful in understanding how a large facility like OHSU might use the same software that a small practice was using when they did the study. And then validation was done through member checking or sitting down with the participants with notes and diagrams and going through them and saying, did I get this right? Is this how things really work in your clinic? And of course, triangulation is looking across all of these data types to try to see, did I misunderstand something? Was something unclear? Or more importantly, was there a conflicting response between the participants? And that happened uh, frequently. An MA had one perception of how things happened. The medical record staff may have thought they happened much differently. And that did happen a fair amount. So how were uh, data analyzed? Well, I used a method called cognitive work analysis. And that's in the title of the presentation, so it must be very important. <laughs> cognitive work analysis uh, came from cognitive systems engineering. Specifically, it came from the RISO labs in Europe. Uh, and Jan Rasmussen, who's known in a number of different fields, including cognitive science, of course, engineering, design of complex systems for controlling things like nuclear power plants. So it came from an engineering perspective. And in 1999, Akim Vicente wrote a book on cognitive work analysis that's kind of become the textbook for how to use methods. But more importantly, the idea behind cognitive work analysis is to be able to deconstruct a complex socio-technical domain, if you will, and understand it across multiple levels of abstraction. So I'm going to say multiple levels of abstraction a few times today, and I'm going to define what that means in just a moment. But the idea is that I cross not just workflow, not just workflow and technology, but I look across the entire work system in an effort to understand why things are done, not just what is done. The techniques used in cognitive work analysis, especially for data collection, are fairly typical. I mentioned the interviews, the observations, but we can also um, do things like traditional task analysis as a way of documenting the action of workflow before, uh, as a way of comparing it with other sites and trying to understand why. It's adaptable. There are many, many approaches. Um, and as you read some of these books on cognitive work analysis, some have six stages, some have five. And that was intentional. So there's a lot of flexibility built into the framework based on the needs of your analysis. And then it's not widely adopted in healthcare, at least yet. There was a review, a scoping review by Jim Carlow that talked about how often it's been used in healthcare. And I was really struck to find out that few, if any, used all five or six stages in their cognitive work analysis. Whether I was wise or stupid, I used all six. <laughs> so the, really, the central idea behind understanding cognitive work is, this, is really illustrated by science and on the beach, the famous analogy. So the uh, psychologist, uh, Herbert Simon, basically said you can understand the actions of an ant zigzagging on a beach by understanding the beach. So think of these as work, uh, work uh, constraints that guide or shape how work can be done within that domain. So I was interested not only in what our ant is doing, but also what the beach was like. And so as we go through, um, I think this, I, this holistic approach, I hope, will come through, because that was really my goal. So what does the method actually look like? Again, it's a very flexible, uh, flexible set of tools that can be mixed and matched based on the needs of the analysis. Um, this is a diagram from Gavin Winter, who has probably done more work on applied cognitive work analysis uh, than a lot of people. He's not primarily an academic, but he's worked closely with some of the Australian contingent uh, that have, uh, for example, uh, Nalini Nikar, who many of you may have read her with. So his applied approach was based on academic research. Having said that, though, we looked at five different areas of the work domain. And very briefly, because we're not going to go through each step today, simply we don't have time, the work domain is a way of mapping the entire beach. Work organization looks at what is the ant actually doing now. Social organization, how do multiple ants cooperate? How do they exchange information? Is it synchronous? Is it asynchronous? Work tasks. What are they actually doing within that work organization? And of course, work tasks can be physical, sorting pieces of paper before I deliver them to the provider, cognitive. 
This is interesting because, as you know, cognitive work analysis seems to imply this is focused just on cognitive work. But as it turns out, just about any work you would do in a clinic has some cognitive elements. And in Klein's, uh, Crandall, Klein, and one other person's book, I apologize, I have to the end, uh, they talk about how pipe fitters do cognitive work. So don't think of cognition in terms of a physician making a diagnosis, although that's cognitive work, but also a medical assistant sorting through lab reports and finding one that seems to be critical is also a cognitive work. So the physical and the cognitive do tend to blur. And of course, automate. Uh, I have electronic information coming into these practices. I looked at how those are handled as well. And then finally, we look at individual strategies or cognitive uh, pathways that individuals or teams could use to get the work done. So that's basically the framework. And when I talk about the different stages, this is what I mean. I talked about abstraction and I talked about decomposition. Once again, the idea is to look across multiple levels of abstraction. So starting at the top, cognitive work analysis looks at the purpose for the domain. Why does this specific work system exist? What is it there to do? What values and priorities shape the work that goes on? What is the work in abstract terms and in very specific terms? And as we get to the lowest level of abstraction, we look at resources. What are the physical objects in that domain? What are the types of information that come into the domain that support the upper levels of abstraction? And note that this is also termed a means and hierarchy, simply being that anything down here can be a means to accomplish the ends up here. So this is the 30,000 foot view of the socio-technical work domain of information handling in primary care. Work itself is broken down into three main areas. Work situations. A situation might be pulling a, a lab report off of a printer as opposed to receiving it electronically through an interface. That those would be different work situations. A function, which we'll talk about in some detail in just a moment. And then, of course, the physical, cognitive, and automated tasks that actually occur in that domain. The cognitive tasks are really based on a lot of cognitive science. I mean, we were talking a little bit earlier about who came first, naturalistic decision making, we climb that out, or Rasmussen's first idea, where he came up with something called the decision ladder. So I'll leave that for the scholars. Uh, but what I find in the decision ladder, which I'll walk you through in just a moment, is that it has built in a lot of this new cognitive science, as well as the standard such as Ensley's situation analysis. So what is going on? Well, first of all, I define the cognitive tasks that I want to focus on, because I couldn't look at everything, as key control decisions that determine how information is passed through the clinic. So if I were a medical assistant looking at a discharge summary, how do I decide whether that needs to be handed to the physician or left on the desk? Those are cognitive decisions that determine how information is handled. So that was my definition. And within each one of those, the decision ladder provides a way of looking at cues and triggers. How do I know that I need to think through that process or do some action? What are the decision criteria? Remember that situations and context is different. And people make decisions based on context. Very rarely is there a nice, neat flowchart. If it's this, do that. Hence, the cognitive work becomes so important at every level in a small practice. What are the options for action? What can I do with that information? And then plans for action. So I won't go through this, but one other point about the decision ladder is, is crucial, which is the idea that when people really make decisions, they use cognitive shortcuts. And those shortcuts allow you to go uh, jump straight from awareness of a situation to an action, or of course you can do the full ladder and make a thoughtful, lengthy decision. So that's the background. Let's get into the results itself. We did four cognitive work analysis. I'm not going to walk you through each of the six stages for each of the four sites. I'd love to know. We're going to go straight into AIM2, though, and focus on the comparison and synthesis, and then conclude by talking about the design implications. Uh, this is a photo of the Blue Clinic. Uh, more on that in just a moment. Uh, a couple things to point out. The long hallway passing the medical records area. A lot of communication occurred in that hallway. This window is where the triage nurse sat. 
This is where the medical record staff sat in voice uh, range of the triage nurse. So we'll talk about physical layout as well. So where did I do this work? Uh, I mentioned that I did four uh, sites here in Oregon, geographically separated. All of them had an electronic health record. Uh, three of them had different ones. Two of them had the same. Uh, the enrolled sites I, I gave color names to. And again, we want to protect their confidentiality. So they are called, for the purposes of the study, the Violet Clinic, which is a small solo practice in a 1,000-person rural town in the southern Orlando Valley. The Red Clinic is a suburban clinic here in Portland with an MA and an administrator. The Blue Clinic is a much larger clinic on the coast. Uh, more on them in a moment. And then the Green Clinic uh, is located on the the Gorge and is also a very large clinic. The goal of choosing these was to get a range of complexity, geographic diversity, and we talked about the NHL. So to gather uh, the information, I spent a fair amount of time in the field, uh, 20 days uh, of field time, not including travel time. I interviewed 24 individuals and observed for over 40 hours. Now, these were the focused observations. Keep in mind, I spent a lot of time in practice just wandering around, sitting in the lounge, doing opportunistic interviews. These were focused observations using the observation. Results. Blue Clinic. We talked a little bit about the physical layout, the positioning of the triage nurse with respect to the medical records. They were also organized into two sections. So the architecturally, they had a west wing, they had an east wing, and their processes were somewhat different between the two wings. They actually had somewhat different team cultures in the two different wings. At Green Clinic, that was a little bit different. Even though they had four individual wings with more providers, their processes seemed to be a bit more standardized. Red Clinic, of course, had only three people. It had a physician, a medical assistant, who was fairly new, and their office administrator, who was related to the physician. And then finally, Violet Clinic didn't even have an MA. It was one solo doc, and she had a part-time bookkeeper that would come in, who was a jack of all pants. She would do the scanning, uh, in the electronic health record, she would keep the books, but she was only there for a couple of days a week. So again, the goal here is to find a diverse set of clinics to try to understand the similarities that are different. <laughs> well, these are the, uh, the abstractions and the, and the decompositions that emerged from that work. First of all, what is the purpose of the domain? Well, receive and handle external clinical information to support primary care. Now note that this was set by the design of the site. So that did not emerge from the sites, but everything below that did. We're going to talk a lot about the top values and priorities. We're going to talk about resources. But before we go there, I'd like to spend a few minutes just talking about how they did things in the clinic and what the implications might be for uh, factors that shape work practices. Recall that there were three levels of work practice decomposition. There was the function, there was the task, and the situation. So these are the four abstract functions. And the goal here is not to say how do you do things, but what do you do, and what is the central purpose behind doing it. And both, um, and I was influenced by the literature of you, but also I really feel like these did encapsulate what was going on in those clinics. So there were four things that really were going on. The first is receiving functions or retrieval functions. Get the stuff into the clinic. The second was to incorporate that into the patient record. In all four clinics, that patient record happened to be an electronic health record. I would have been just as happy if it had been paper charts. Evaluate. We found three different levels of evaluation going on. Uh, the first is screening by non-clinical staff. They might not even know they were doing it. I take a fax off the fax machine. I notice there's a critical lab result. I know I need to do something. A lot of people would not recognize that that process even happens. And they may try to eliminate the step of the MA or the clerk intercepting a piece of paper. So we'll talk more about the implications of taking people out of the process in an effort to streamline it. But screening turned out to be a really important process. Triage is something I defined, and I realize triage has a clinical meaning. But here, it means that a second level provider or a highly trained medical assistant is doing a review of information rather than a staff person or a clerk or the physician who's responsible for the 
And then finally, the review step is the provider themselves who are always responsible for reviewing information that comes into practice. And then finally, the communication phase. Communication, of course, can occur within the practice, and this happened by using office email, handwritten notes, verbal communication, and using uh, features within the electronic health record as a means of communicating between staff, providers, medical records, and so forth. So there were variations, as you can imagine. And those variations, first of all, included the sequence of work. So if we look at these four different functions and how those functions were sequenced, you can see, hopefully, a stark difference between blue and violet clinic when they handle paper and red and green when they handle paper. The difference is here. In this case, in sequence one, paper was received, given on as documents to the provider, the provider reviewed them on paper, initialed, hand wrote, circled things, highlighted it, and sent those back to medical records or to their clerks where they were incorporated into the electronic health record uh, scan. Meanwhile, in Green and Red Clinic, they were incorporated initially upon receipt. So everything went through in Green Clinic, the medical records folks, they were incorporated into the electronic health record, and the provider would evaluate it within the EHR. No. Many times they would print out the document to review it. So it would come in on paper, it would be incorporated into the EHR, and then for reasons that we'll talk about, it would be printed out again. So that's a little bit about work sequencing. There were other situations that varied. Of course, the information sources varied, the medium, paper, electronic, verbal. Uh, urgency and need. Medical records people often knew that something was expected. Uh, if a uh, provider had been asking me all week, where are those records I asked for? When they come in, I'm going to be aware of that, I'm going to remember it, and I'm probably going to hand it over to the provider. So the need was also there. Urgency, um, as a lab tech, I have been calling critical results for years. That didn't really happen a lot. We were dealing with primary care practices. There weren't a lot of critical results. So frankly, the verbal communication from outside providers was fairly minimal. And then, of course, time of day. Um, all of the practices offer uh, extended hours and staffing needs. Do I have a registered nurse that's capable of doing the triage steps? So all of those define the situations that thus drove the work practices. So we won't go through every one of these, but you can see the variation across clinics between how they receive paper information, electronic, and verbal. This tiny, whoops, this tiny little clinic only received information on paper, but they had just licensed a standalone fax server, a HIPAA compliant fax server that did not integrate with the electronic health record. So it was interesting watching them sort of play with it and see how that was going to fit into the workflow. Next, interfaces. Three of the four had at least one laboratory results interface that sent structured data into the electronic health record. Two of them had more than one. And then portals. Uh, portals, as you know, are, are external uh, access points that are either regional health information ex uh, exchanges, although none of my sites use that, or they were uh, portals into the health system's electronic health record, where they had selective access to either their own patients or through a function called break the glass, they could get at other patients but had that documented that they've reviewed those records. So these portals potentially gave them a huge amount of information outside of their practice that in theory is only a click away. In practice, because they have no way of knowing what's out there, what might be out there, it's a phishing expedition. Unless the patient tells you I was admitted to Providence, I'm not going to go look at Providence portal on the off chance that there's something in there. So while this is a valuable source of information, the usage was not what I would have expected it to be. Um, and so we won't go through all of these, but I think you can see that there's a pretty wide variety uh, in the types of information and the methods used to receive that information. This is the, uh, I think Paul calls this, the describing the schematic of the 747. So I'm just going to point out a couple of features. In the incorporation function, we're talking about getting stuff into the patient record. Again, if it were a paper chart, it would be a binary stuff. In the case of the electronic health record, there are basically five or six ways you could get stuff in there. So we're going to start by talking about scanning. Now, scanning was done in different ways at different places, and the main difference seemed to be whether I could scan directly into the electronic health record 
or if I had to go through an intermediate software package called a document management system. Blue Clinic was the only one with the document management system. Notice that OHSU uses the same document management system in the medical record store. So their workflow in a small clinic was essentially based on what we would do at a large health system. This presented some issues. First of all, the inspection and preparation was more rigorous for the document management system because the document management system would try to read barcodes. So if you have a document to be scanned, they had little pieces of white tape that they would clip out and paste over barcodes to keep it from, quote, confusing the scan. So preparation wasn't just about visual inspection, does this look good, are pages missing? It's actually looking at the content itself and making sure that it would be clean and scanned. And then moving over here, we get into a number of other terms, matching, indexing, naming, and assigning. And I'll draw your attention to one gap. Here, we have the option to assign a scanned document to a provider so it shows up in your inbox. That occurred at Green, Red, and Violet Clinic. Over here, that option was not available. Through the mechanism of their document management system, they did not have the option of sending things to a physician inbox. Could that have been one of the reasons they chose to scan later, review first? In fact, it was. The timing was very important. The providers wanted to see the paper because they knew this was a lengthy process. And once it was in the document management system, they still could not see it in the electronic health record. So it's essentially a two-step process rather than a one-step process. So I could go on about scanning, but that turned out to be a far more elaborate process than I would have expected. Indexing. Well, as you know, indexing is firewall stuff. And in the paper uh, chart, there's a long history of paper chart organization. You've got your tabs. And tabs usually laboratory, radiology, hospital. People kind of know what to expect on a paper chart. This is an actual paper chart that they've archived in the sites. In the electronic health record, on the other hand, it's a little trickier for a number of reasons. First of all, in many electronic health records, whether this is how they were designed by the vendor or how they were implemented by the implementer, there are different categories or tabs or buckets that scan documents can be put into. So the act of indexing wasn't just getting it into the EHR. It was figuring out which bucket to put it in. And in the case of Blue Clinic, there were 34 subcategories and 11 categories of where to put stuff. And as the provider or the MA looking for those data, how do I know where they are? So you can see the handwriting on here. They've been live on their EHR for a little over a year and continue to move things around in the chart because of confusion, because the mental model of where things should be in the electronic health record was different than where medical records people were putting things. So work in progress. Another thing is the naming. So where it goes in the chart is important, but you can also put a short label on an electronic document. And that shows up in the document list, in the document trees. Green Clinic had a formal process with a procedure of how they named their document. And this is a case of a culture where they would type in the type of culture, date, pause, negative, and so on. So that when the provider of the MA saw that in a list, they not only knew what it was, but they had some idea of what was it. This is a human adding metadata to a document to make it easier to find downstream. Now, I don't know if somebody taught them to do this, if they came across this themselves, but neat idea. And then probably these folks probably could have done the same thing. Now, I mentioned there are many, many ways to incorporate information into the medical record. Fact server. Two of the sites had an operational fax server. By the clinic, had a fax server they were just kind of breaking in. But the idea is that the faxes come, are sent by the source as a fax. But they come in electronically and they sit on a server somewhere as a fax image. So what happens next? Well, first of all, unlike the fax machine, I can't hear or see a fax. It's sitting in an electronic queue somewhere. So I have to be able to access that queue to see what's in there. Second, all of the sites had one fax number, which means everything dumped into the same bucket, including sandwich orders from the shop down the street. <laughs> so part of the function of the medical records person was to go through this fax queue and get rid of spam faxes and figure out what was important and what wasn't. Again, they indexed it, they named it, and off it went into the electronic health record. So that was fax server. Interfaces, again, were limited, at least in the sites I went to, to laboratory results and radiology results uh, coming in from outside. 
So there were several different uh, factors that came in. We talked about assigning, but also matching. And the automated cognitive processing that happened tried to determine, is this the right patient? Is this the right provider? And should I link this to an order? Now, there were implications of not linking faxes or not linking electronic orders or, or results to an order. Recall that I place an order for a lab test in the EHR. It has a status. I'd like to be able to look at that status and see if the result is bad. If this matching goes wrong, that doesn't happen. And it, uh, there were cases where one particular lab would not hyphenate patient names. The interface would throw it out when it came back. It would sit in an orphan file and have to be manually reconciled. Only one site had a practice for routinely checking the orphan file to see if it was So again, you can see that cognitive functioning impacts automation as well as humans. And then finally, evaluation. We talked about, oh, I'm sorry. Some other ways of getting information into the electronic health record uh, included entry or dictation, use of a special EHR account, for example, a telephone account or a document in that phone call, and then cutting and pasting from the portal, which was used very, very rarely. The, uh, some physicians liked using it, most did not, and they would simply summarize what they saw in the portal in their clinical notes. We talked about screening, we talked about triage, so I'm going to move on from there because I'm running a lot of time. And then finally, communication is the fourth function. Uh, and we talked about three different areas of communication, internal communication, using notes, email, and communication, but also patient notification. And as you can imagine, there were several different ways that could be done. The preference was to do it in person, either over the telephone, where the medical assistant would call a patient, or in a subsequent visit with the provider. If it were a critical te uh, test result, they may or may not call the patient. It was based on judgment. And this also reflects what was in the literature. Procedures for calling test results to patients were largely ad hoc, and in many cases, dependent on a no news is good news approach. Now, patient engagement, that's probably not going to fly anymore. Only two sites had a patient portal in their electronic health record to provide electronic access. But again, that was selective. The provider had to choose to release certain information to the portal. And at least in the towns that I went to, because they were largely small and rural, the uptake of the portal was actually very low. People didn't seem to find much value. So moving on. Mail was another one. Um, mail was not often used. This is an example of a mailer card where they would hand write the results in the path and mail it. Uh, why? Postage fees. It's not something I would think of in terms of a shaping factor for doing information management, but it was. So, what explains this practice variation? Well, we introduced you before to the uh, abstraction and the decomposition. We talked about purpose, but what about the values and priorities, and what about the individual resources that determine the processes we just talked about? Well, we'll begin at the top, most abstract part of the hierarchy. External priorities. Well, laws and regulations, obviously. The, I think the most uh, salient example is using fax machines. Why? Yeah. So um, I've been told that the medical industry is probably the last bastion of fax sales, but here we are. They, they all have fax machines. They all have to use them. Standards of care still for practice. In the state of Oregon, am I allowed to have a medical assistant with a no formal training review a test result and screen it before passing it on to me? Contractual obligations. Two of the sites had recently been recognized as patient-centered medical homes. One of them was part of an accountable care organization, CCO. That had contractual requirements for handling of information. Suddenly, they cared a lot more about tracking pending orders, about communicating results to patients. Community and patient expectations. It's all well and good that I have a relationship with the hospital next door, so I don't expect to get discharge summaries from the big hospital down the road. Well, that's not what the patient expects. The patient expects providers to communicate regardless of their organizational preferences or affiliations, and so on. Business. Business was huge. I mentioned stamps being just one small example. But business factors, um, the site in the Columbia Gorge was fairly well off. They weren't struggling. They were a beautiful practice with art on the walls. The coast practice was in a small town that had been just decimated by a London crash, poor patient population, an older building, it was well maintained, it was lovely, 
but it was an older building. The point is that they had business concerns that drove how they did work. How many patients did they need to see per day? Was it an issue that Dr. Smith would spend four hours working on notes every night instead of seeing patients? Yes. So again, business constraints also determine how they would approach doing information. And then finally, individual preferences and priorities. Um, I mentioned the physician that would spend four hours doing notes. Why? Because she believed that's the right way to do clinical narrative. You sit down and you write them up, and you don't click a few things on a template, and then send the patient out of the exam room and close the account and call it good. Some did, some did. OK. One thing I really liked, though, was at Blue Clinic, because of the, I think, the patient-centered medical home, which was a fairly recent development, they posted six values along that back hallway where, they, uh, where the staff would travel as a reminder. It's a way of essentially emphasizing their organizational culture that, hey, this is what we are about. Otherwise, though, as you can imagine, getting at values, getting at priorities through interviews and certainly through observation was very difficult to do. And I'll talk about that as an initiation of study. Physical constraints. Well, we've touched on many, many of these examples. Obviously, the source. Can the laboratory send an electronic test result, first of all? Can I afford to buy the interface? These interfaces, by the way, go anywhere from $15,000 to $30,000 per interface. And often, the lab will meet the cost of that, but only if you send me enough lab work to make it work in a while. So I'm constrained financially by what, uh, by what uh, labs can send me electronic information. Limitations and affordances. More on that in just a moment. Content. One thing I did not focus on intentionally was the form, the structure, the actual representation of information, either on the screen or on paper. I considered it basically a blob of stuff, and I followed it through the process. In future studies, I would like to look more at the representation and the actual content in the moment. So again, I won't list out all of these, but hopefully we've touched on staffing, Staffing and people, technical capabilities, and then, of course, human factors. The ability to deal with interruptions, attention. All of these were comfortable environments to work in. They were well lit. But they may not be so. There might be practices out there that might feel like sweatshops. So what are the uh, design implications? Uh, home stretch, we have three more slides to go. Well, first of all, what is design? I am not a designer. I'm not trained as a designer. Although, if I took more of Dr. Hunt's courses, maybe someday I could do that. So these are just my impressions from looking at how processes work and how the existing paper and electronic systems supported the abstract and concrete activities <coughs> that I wanted to look at. So first of all, what, what would you want to do? Well, with any technology or process, you'd want to make things more efficient, more effective, reduce or eliminate errors, certainly. Enhance worker comfort and satisfaction. Make it more pleasant to do that. How frustrating is it to know that there's a scan document and click and click and click and not be able to find it? And then support and encourage adaptive activity. And I mentioned that Gavin Lindturn was uh, sort of the applied approach that I used. He, he used that term to really bring us back to this idea that we have a beach, we have an ant, and the constraints on that beach really shape what my options as a worker are in shaping. Uh, how I do things. So if I were talking to a designer and they said, what did you learn in four pro uh, primary care practices that I could, uh, I could take home and maybe use my designs? My answer would be, first of all, look for affordances, which implies, by the way, go and look. You're not going to get this from reading a procedure manual or interviewing one or two subject matter experts. You've got to be in the environment and you've got to see it. This is an affordance. I have multiple displays set up on my desktop. I can open the electronic health record. I can open the portal. I can move things back and forth. This is a visual cue. By stacking up pieces of paper, I can see essentially a real-time cue and a status of how much work I have to do. That is a very thick chart. That's going to be a lot of work, visual cue. These are the two printers I may have mentioned before. Notice the blue paper, blue paper for lab results, white paper for everything else. And then, of course, the inbox paper gets put in a slot. I hear paper being put in my slot. I'm now aware that there's something wrong. So when we automate these processes, do I replace these affordances with something else, something similar, something better? Situational awareness. Again, getting back to Ensley's thought, that we have perception of something, we have an understanding of that, and then we can project into the future what that means. 
So how do we support or enhance it? Well, first of all, make information states visible. With a stack of charts sitting on the table, that's a visible state. It's sitting there. It's in a pile for me to review. I know I need to go look at that. But when you automate it and you put it in these little queues or these little folders or these little jelly bean bubbles in the electronic health record that light up when there's a new lab result, it's a different form of perception to try to keep up on this. Monitor and provide feedback. Uh, no one really monitored how often things were late for laboratories or how often a specialist failed to send uh, a specialty report. Ensure automated tasks are transparent. This was huge. One of the features I got pretty excited about was an automatic overdue result bucket. So you look in the EHR, and there's this big tab there, and it says overdue results. And you click on it, and there's stuff in there. Now, why don't you use this? This is fantastic. The answer, I don't know why things go in there. When I look at them, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Uh, and so we don't use it. So the transparency was not there. They didn't understand what the EHR was doing by putting things into those buckets and thus they were probably missing out on what could be a, a useful feature. Um, highlighting relevant and context appropriate information, really stressing the idea of context. Um, our approach is to put more and more information on screens to basically try to give them everything there, either on the screen or a few clicks away. The idea though, they need to be contextually specific. Um, and we won't go through all of those, but Worker adaptation. And this gets into really sort of the conclusion uh, that Kim Vicente would say, which is to let the worker finish the design. So the design can only go so far, but the worker really needs to be able to modify these tools so it works best in their environment. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, certain tasks may add value in unexpected ways. The, uh, the clerk pulling a fax and looking, doing this informal screening function, that adds value. Because if I take that away, it sits in the inbox until the provider is done for the day, until they're between patients, until they can log on and see it. So it adds a point where I can catch things. And in systems uh, in uh, engineering, we would call that loose coupling. That a tightly coupled system doesn't have many opportunities to intervene. A loosely coupled system, however, does. Of course, there are pros and cons of this. Uh, individuals organize in a similar way different. Um, I saw providers that would, again, print out things from the portal, spread them out on the desk to use multiple monitors. So the way they would assimilate information was very different from providers. Uh, different mental models. We touched on this with the organization of the paper chart versus how the electronic health record was set up, especially with respect to scan documents, roles and responsibilities, and small practices. The medical records folks in one practice also covered the telephones in the other practice. They were very specialized and stayed in the room. And I am done. I am completely <laughs> done. Thank you, James. So, uh, he invites your questions. James, thank you. Excellent. Um, early on, uh, you were talking about your methodology and cognitive work analysis, and you made a comment that um, most of the, if not all of the other authors that you have read have not used all five or six stages, but you chose to do that. I was wondering what your thinking was behind that and, and why you thought it was important to do. I think they had much narrower focus. So I was looking at a complete socio-technical system, and the framework really described all of it. So that was my goal. If I were doing a design project or, say, um, I don't know, uh, setting up a crash card in ICU, that may be focused just on one or two stages because that gives me enough information to inform the design. So it really comes down to, as we would say, the research question or the purpose of the analysis. Thank you. Um, now, you mentioned you used uh, you know, your cognitive work analysis to look at a complex socio-technical system. I was, and you mentioned that it was a, a toolbox or a collection of analysis techniques. So I was wondering, um, what aspects of that toolbox you found useful and what aspects you didn't? If you could speak to that a little bit. Yeah, um, I, I think <coughs> I was misled in a way. When I read Vicente's book, he says right up front, this is not a cookbook. This is a framework. This is not a set of methods. Um, I didn't quite take that to heed. I thought I could read enough and basically have a methodology. Cognitive work analysis doesn't work that way. 
it provides a structure of scaffolding that you can insert methods. And if we go back to this hierarchy, the idea is that I can use different data collection and analysis methods to fill in each one of these rows. And I'll say this now, that in future work, I could use culture surveys, uh, interviews, uh, more advanced techniques to really try to understand values and priorities. I don't think I got there in this study. And then uh, also, uh, in terms of cognitive work tasks. Um, again, I, part of my method was based on cognitive task analysis and being able to walk people through their mental reasoning, but that wasn't the main focus of my interviews. And I think I missed out on a lot of richness. So to answer your question, I think the methods can be mixed and matched and inserted in the scaffolding, but cognitive work analysis doesn't tell you what to use. Um, just to add on to that, are there any particular analysis techniques or representations that you found useful and others that you didn't find it useful? Uh, the decision lab. Um, originally, I found it very intimidating because it is. It's a complex representation. But after reading more Ensley on situation awareness and really understanding why this was important, everywhere I looked, I could see cues and triggers. I could see people evaluating external information to make decisions. And I could also see decision shortcuts. So, for example, um, Dr. Smith always wants the full chart scanned when it's received from an outside source, Dr. Jones doesn't. Those are rules. So, the decision line, I think, turned out to be an important structure. I will tell you, I did not create a diagram for every single control task. I didn't need to. Uh, once I understood the framework, I could apply that in tabular form that we'll just throw. Is that kind of interesting? Yeah. Uh, the abstraction decomposition hierarchy, just right here, uh, I, I've grown to love. I've really grown to love. What about those maps and some of the tools that you found useful? Right. Physical map. Uh, what Paul's talking about is when I did the number checking, when I went back into the clinic to make sure I understood what was really going on, the way I did that was to draw these happy little maps and, and use color coding. To use color coding, it's a little hard to see, but basically to spread out, this is how paper is handled, this is how verbal communication is handled, and we walked through this with multiple participants. So I uh, picked this up from observation, from interviews, then I went back on the second visit. I don't think I mentioned that. I visited each site twice. The second visit was all about going through these maps of the clinic, and trying to make sure I understood the physical flow of information. Um, there's one question tweeted from James McKenna. Can you speak a bit more to any unexpected dangers you noted regarding mimicking a hospital, like the doc management system? Wow. Um, one of the applications of cognitive work analysis is to do a failure mode and effects type analysis, a more engineering type focus, where you're looking at where things go wrong. That wasn't the study I did, I will tell you. There were many, uh, many times where I saw things get misplaced, where I heard conversations, where is this, where is that, this should have been back by now. I didn't see anything dangerous, so uh, it's hard to say. Keep in mind, though, that I was only in the clinics for a small amount of time. I was focused on looking at certain workflows, and more importantly, uh, they were probably protective about what they let me hear. I have a researcher walking around the whole thing. So the short answer is, I don't know if there have been any really hazardous situations if I've ever seen them. I didn't. I did see many, many cases, though, and this reflects the literature, where things would get lost, misplaced. I would expect something to come back and out. So, um, did, did you tweet that that answer? No. no. I know you identified a lot of uh, examination of the social systems as well. Um, I'm curious, when you were interviewing uh, your subjects from different sites, did you find that there might have been, through the process of triangulation, that the perceptions of the people within the clinics may have been discordant? Or was there any evident change between one clinic or the other? And if so, did that have any implications, do you believe, for their, their shared situation? to the shared frames of reference, or even how they, how well or not with the function? Um, yes, I definitely found discordant information across multiple participants within the same site. So, uh, for, for example, uh, when I first interviewed uh, the physician at the clinic, 
he said, everything comes in electronically. I, everything's electronic. And we find out that the that admin is sitting at the front desk scanning things. Mm -hmm. Their perception was different. It's electronic to the provider. It is not electronic to the administrative system. So there were a lot of discordant things. Uh, there were also differences of opinion. Uh, the medical records people had an idea of how that chart should be organized. And they probably had some say when they set up the electronic health record with what those categories might be. Providers, on the other hand, they've gotten used to them by now. They kind of knew where to look for things. They would not have done that. So again, whether it's constraint of the vendor making it that way or whether it's how it's set up, I don't know. That was discordant. Looking across sites, I, medical records people, the two sites that had full-time medical records staff, by the way, uh, Mean Clinic had two people, Blue Clinic had two people. Even though they did rotate from phones and some other areas, they thought of themselves as the stewards of the medical record. And so they had an ownership that was very interesting. There was one comment when uh, the one doctor that did dictation would send the dictation out to somebody they knew in the community. It would come back in an email and it would be pasted into an interim note in the electronic health record by the medical records person. I thought, well, isn't that interesting? Why do you do that? No one else can do it. She really thought that the quality would suffer if somebody else did pasting in the electronic health record. So uh, does that give you some examples? Thank you, James. May I do okay. acknowledgments? Uh, I think James is really showing uh, all the signs of being a true academic. He loves to talk about his work. <laughs> <laughs> Let's give him a hand. Go ahead. Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Gorman. Of course, uh, thank you to my committee, to Joan Ash, who couldn't be here today, to all my committee members. Special thanks to Gavin Linter from Australia, who let me sit in on his course and has been a great help to me. Um, all the clinics that let me uh, watch and, and spend time with them. DMICE, obviously, the, the faculty and staff here. DMICE, my family, friends, Magdalene, of course, and a long list of people that really gave a, a lot of time very generously. A lot of these names you may recognize. I didn't think I was going to get Hardeep Singh on the phone to talk about my work. He was more than happy to do that. So all of these people were tremendous. And with that, I will conclude. Oh, and thank you to the NLM and NLM for funding three years of my PhD. Yeah. All right. Thank you all for coming. Uh, you're all excused now, so we can uh, continue.